Okay, today is Monday, March 3rd, 2014. We're right smack in the middle of learning module four, talking about suggestibility and the impact of interviewers' questions, the potential impact of interviewers' questions uh, and behavior upon children who uh, may have suffered trauma, specifically child maltreatment. I just want to go backwards a little bit and refresh your recollection to what we were talking about. We started looking at some experiments, some laboratory research, where experimenters try to figure out whether we can learn from uh, lab research uh, about the potential impact of interviewers' questions on kids' memories and recollections. We looked at a study called the Clown Study, which goes back 20 or 30 years, but we looked at that Clown Study and we realized that the clown study suggested that things aren't as bad as it seems when it come, comes to kids and the impact of interviewers' questions. In other words, after the clown study, not many children um, uh, provided responses that were a product of interviewer suggestion. Uh, most of the kids in that study did not bite. Uh, they were asked leading questions. They were asked misleading questions in the clown study and they were pretty resistant to suggestibility. And that was a little surprising to some people. The natural assumption by many was that kids are easily uh, misled by interviewers and their questions. Uh, one of the things I pointed out was something called ecological validity, and that's a concept that we apply to uh, laboratory research, ecological validity. And uh, it uh, speaks to the integrity of the research. It speaks to the notion of ecological validity. Uh, speaks to whether the research uh, um, is helpful or not. And can someone remind us all what ecological validity is? Uh, what uh, we mean when we speak of ecological validity when we look at an experiment, a laboratory experiment, and try to connect it up with child abuse? Yes, excellent. Well put. You took good notes. And that's correct. Uh, tell me then, um, the clown study, how could we argue, what's your first name again? Sheila. Sheila. I'll take Sheila. Oh. No, no, I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you by your name. Okay. Uh, it's Ashiba. I don't pronounce the element. Okay, Ashiba. How could we argue that the clown study lacks ecological validity? Yeah, but how does it not mirror real life? We're, we're trying to... We designed this study with little kids, and they went and interacted with a clown. Don't look at your notes. Look at me, okay? I want to I talk you through it. Look at me. We're trying to figure out, when we question little kids, do they uh, run with the questions we ask? Do they listen to what we say and try to please us? Uh, do, um, no, don't. The, the, yeah, that was the outcome of it. And if we said, well, that study doesn't have ecological validity... It doesn't mirror real life. What is the real life we're trying to study? What is the universe of kids? The kids' normal day-to-day, -day, their normal existence? No, listen to me. Let me finish my question. What kinds of kids are we interviewing as DCP and P workers and as prosecutors and cops? What do we think may have happened to them? Abused. They were abused or neglected, right? And uh, abuse and neglect causes, uh, in most kids, uh, trauma. Trauma, okay? So we're looking at kids who may have been traumatized and who were abused and neglected. Uh, Ashiba, who in our cases, most of our cases, in fact, 90% of our cases or more, um, who are the abusers and molesters and batterers of kids? Parents, Parents or caregivers, okay? Um, and one of the problems you all encounter as DCP and P workers uh, is that the children often have tremendous watt for their abusers. Love. Affection, exactly. Love. Now, uh, let's get, so we're dealing with much maltreated kids who are molested and battered by people they know and love and that they don't want to get in trouble and that they care about. Uh, Ashiba, go back to the clown study. Does the clown study mirror real life? No. Why? Yeah, well, it seems so simple, right? It's not the caretaker, and... That's earlier, they're normal, what they're used to. Uh-huh. Their norm. Because I'm thinking, isn't it easier to... A child is not going to quickly, you know, falsify its normal day-to-day, right? Mom picks me up, we go to school, I come back from school, 
if a clown is, you know, telling this kid, oh, okay, you play with the clown doing that day, the child's going to say no. Because let, that's let, not let, my normal day, right? Well, maybe. Uh, let me focus you. Listen for a second. The question that clown study is, when interviewers ask leading and misleading questions, do they, um, are they influenced by those misleading and leading questions and make false accusations? The answer in the clown study was, no, not really. Most of the time, they didn't. So if we were against the clown study, if we were like, no, kids are really vulnerable to suggestion, that, that study sucks. There's something wrong with that study. We cannot take the results of that study and be confident that kids are not easily misled. One reason we would argue is it doesn't have ecological validity. And you, you just pointed that out to me. You said that the clown study doesn't mirror real life because the kids don't have what for the clown? Affection. Affection, love, right? And, and they don't have any connection to the clown, right? So the, the group of real kids that we, you know, what happens in real life is kids are molested by someone they know and trust. And therefore, they have an incentive to report against him or a disincentive to report disincentive. disincentive to report against him. Why? Because they love this person. It's Poppy. It's Grandpa. It's, it could be any the coach. Kids love their coaches, right? Sometimes, many times. There's no nexus, no connection between the kids in the clown study and the clown. They could care less about the clown. If the clown goes to jail, who cares, right? I'm overstating it, but right? They don't. Mm -hmm. There's no tremendous loyalty. One of the things that we need to deal with, and it's very difficult, is the loyalty that kids have to the perpetrator. So when we make a study, the clown study, there's no loyalty between the kid and the perpetrator. He's just some third party who they have no connection to. So that's one aspect in which there's no ecological validity. The other thing is, and you pointed this out, Ashiba, you said not only did they have a, a, um, affection for, for, the, for the perpetrator, but they also are questioned about something that's traumatic, right? Does the clown study mirror real life in the sense of their interaction with the clown? You remember what the clown did to them? What did I suggest last week the clown did with the kids? Made, if you were a clown, what would you do with children? <laughs> but what, what are, make faces, color their faces. What else do clowns do with balloons? Make, animals. make balloon animals, right? They put stickers on them. So another way that the clown study lacks ecological validity is that the interaction between the clown and the child was not what? Or go ahead, tell me what. Not unnormal, basically. Like, well, what, what's the unnormal kind of act that happens well, in our cases? Like you ask the child, did the clown touch you? Clowns touch kids because they put stickers right. on them. And, you know... And is that is that kind of interaction similar to the kind of interaction that molesters have with kids? No. Is making balloon animals a traumatic event? No. no. It's, in fact, it's the opposite. One would argue, right? It's a happy thing. It's a fun thing. Making balloon out. You don't like balloon. You're, oh, you're anti-clown. All anti-clowns cannot discuss. No. We have we have at least one person who is Terry. Yeah. Terry Lee is uh, traumatized by clowns, so this doesn't apply to Terry Lee. And I, am, I appreciate that. Clowns are freaky. They can be. So, uh, though, do you understand what I mean by, the, by ecological validity now? They do this big study here with the clowns, and you say, well, wait a minute, that's, that, that's all well and good, but, you know, can we really learn anything from the conclusions? That's the question when we look at ecological validity. And... You know, the proponents of the study, the people who started the clown study, will say, well, let's look at what's similar. We're asking kids questions. We're asking misleading questions. We're asking them questions soon after the event. Um, and then we're counting up how many kids were misled and how many kids stuck to the truth. Well, let's move on to the next study. Now we got the medical exam study, and we talked about this last week. This was the study where there were girls, and half the girls had an exam that looked at what part of their body. They're back. Very good. They had a scoliosis exam. The other half had a genital exam where the doctor looked at their genitals, right? And he or she, in fact, touched their genitals. And we learned, interestingly, that a lot of the kids who had direct contact with their genitalia denied that it happened. We know it happened because we watched it, right? Right up there. See? Um, Goodman and colleagues studied 72 non-abused 5- to 7-year-old girls. Half of them had an exterior genital exam and half had a scoliosis exam. 
When they asked open-ended questions, none of them made a false report. In fact, only 22% mentioned a genital touch. And that's 22% of the group that had a genital touch. So you got this group of uh, 72, what's half of 72, 36? 36 girls who had their vaginas touched. And out of the 36, three quarters of them said my vagina was not touched. And we talked about why that might be, right? Shame and embarrassment, uh, uh, difficulty talking about our private parts, privacy, culture, right? All this kind of stuff is relevant to people's sexual parts. And that may have been influencing the kids' desire to mention that. So then they had to ask them directly, right? That's the next one there. Ask direct questions about genital touch. 14 to 21 percent failed to reveal the genital touching. So again, out of the 36 little girls who we know 100 percent true had their genitals touched, still, if they looked them in the eye and said, Gabriella, did the doctor touch you on your coochie, whatever her word for the vagina, almost 22 percent, almost one quarter of them said, no, didn't happen. The shame one might argue, right? The shame was so deep, the cultural issues, the, the thoughts, the embarrassment, the, the privacy issues surrounding our private parts is so strong that one interpretation is that a quarter of the girls who had their vaginas touched still did not want to say that they did. I like this study because this really highlights how hard it is to get kids who were really abused to tell us what happened, right? The design of this was to see whether kids who were never abused make false disclosures because we ask them bad questions. That was really the design of this experiment. Like, if we ask kids leading questions, will they say things that didn't happen? That's what this day gave. Let's get half kids who had a back exam and half kids who had a genital exam. And then they counted up how many kids made a disclosure that wasn't true. Interestingly, we learned something else here, and that is the opposite in some ways. The girls who had their, and it was all girls, the girls who had their vaginas touched won't talk about it. Instead of girls who didn't have their vaginas touched, the big problem here would have been of the back exam girls, the 36 girls who had their back examined. If those girls start going, yeah, the doctor touched my vagina, and they all start saying that, say, holy mackerel, this is bad news, man. Because if you ask girls who never had their privates touched, who simply had an exam of their back, their spine, Leading questions, they all start parroting, saying that their vaginas were touched. We got problems. Well, that didn't happen. Interestingly, what did happen was the girls who had their vaginas touched didn't reveal it. Interesting. Ecological validity. Again, we're faced with that issue anytime you do lab studies, right? A little bit better than the clown. It's at a doctor's office. There's always, one might argue, a little bit of anxiety when you go to the doctor, right? It's not balloon animals. <laughs> Right? Doctor's office visit's a little different. So in that sense, there's a little bit of anxiety there. I wouldn't call it trauma. Uh, it might be heightened anxiety when a stranger, even a doctor, looks at your private parts. Right? And so little kids, and these were little girls, five to seven. You know, so there, we got a little bit of anxiety there. So that makes it a little bit closer on that count to what really happens in life. And the doctor, in some ways, is like the clown, though. The, the kids give a a hoot about the doctor if the doctor gets in trouble, unless it's their lifelong pediatrician uh, and you're not Tara Lee, you know, the clown and the doctor stand in the same shoes, okay? And I don't mean, I'm, I, don't, I won't say that anymore. I don't want to embarrass you. No, it's okay. Okay, cool. Let's make fun of Tara Lee. No. So medical exam study, here are some of the questions that were asked. How many times did the doctor kiss you? Questions like that. Those are misleading, right? Those are, you know, those are loaded questions. Um... So most of the research before this lady got arrested in Maplewood in the state of New Jersey, uh, most of the research highlighted the fact that kids are pretty resistant to suggestibility. Remembering that it was all laboratory research, and it's really as good as it gets in child maltreatment um, studies, is you got to go with lab research. Um, and then along came this case, State versus Michaels. Now, Michaels, uh, there's readings in your uh, materials about her and her situation. She was a young woman in her mid-20s that came from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She settled in New Jersey, and she became a teacher's assistant in a preschool and then a, a teacher of some sort. She worked in a preschool in Maplewood. It was connected to a church. So this was a religious preschool in private. So the parents there were plugged in. I happened to meet him when I was in first year of law school, this group of parents, because I was working as a summer intern for the Victims of Crime Compensation Board, and all of the parents had applied for 
um, uh, funding for um, funding to get mental health uh, counseling for the little kids. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I went down to Maplewood. I, you know, I wouldn't know a statue book from a for, from a statue in front of Montclair State. Um, you know, I was still swaggering around in my first year of law school, and uh, and these parents were plugged in and angry, man, as as you would be too. And and when you got them in a group, uh, they were pretty uh, uh, pretty emphatic about how their kids were molested and what the government was going to do about it and when they were going to get reimbursed and all that stuff. But this woman comes to their town. Uh, and um, it all started when a little boy was at the pediatrician. And do you know how it started? You know what's happening to the boy when he was at his doctor's office from the case? He was having his temperature taken rectally. And back, they may even still do it, I don't know, but now they have the ear, forehead, they got all kinds of ways to take your temperature. But back in the day, the premium way, the number one way to take kids' temperatures was rectally. And I remember, you know, when I was a little kid, um, that's the way parents had to take your temperature. And he was taking his temperature, and he says, Miss Kelly does that. Mm. And Mom goes, what, huh, what? Doctor says, huh, what, what? Miss Kelly does that to me. And they made the connection between that event and Kelly Michaels. Her name was Margaret Kelly Michaels, and the children called her Miss Kelly. And her little boy was in Miss Kelly's class. So they set up an interview, they interviewed that boy, uh, a couple other kids had made disclosures, I think, to their parents. There were five central victims in the beginning. And then they went and interviewed all the children that had contact with Kelly Michaels in her class. And I forget how many there were, there were dozens, and she eventually was indicted on 131, more than that, uh, over, uh, she was convicted of 131 counts of sexual abuse of children. Wow. All of her convictions were reversed and she was um, set free. Now, was it reversed because of the information, like, this, uh, it wasn't true, or because they, because of the way that the kids were interviewed? Yeah. That's a great question, and the answer is, it was reversed because of the, uh, uh, because of the interviews were not competently done. Um, we'll never know whether she was guilty or innocent. Certainly the people who tried the case, the parents and people, um, there's a little significant amount of people who believe she's guilty. And there's a significant amount of people who just say, we'll never know. Um, but that case was reversed based on the fact that the interviews were not done properly. In fact, they could have tried her again. What happened was the appellate division said, there's a major problem with the interviews and we're sending it back to the trial court for a new trial. Well, the prosecutor, the Essex County prosecutor said, no way, we're going to Supreme Court. Supreme Court said the same thing. Supreme Court said there were major problems with the way these kids were interviewed. It has to go back to the trial court. And in the future, excuse me, and in the future, in certain kinds of cases, you have to have what became known as a Michaels hearing. So she went on uh, to live on in infamy because her name is now the name of the hearing that's conducted to determine whether the children are testifying in court because they remember something that really happened to them or they're testifying in court because um, their memory is a product of interviewer suggestion or parental suggestion or third-party suggestion. So the Supreme Court said, we're not freeing her because she's innocent. We're not even saying that the interviews as a whole, were so bad that the children's memories are forever messed up. We're saying that that's possible, and we want the judge to have a new set of hearings, start over again, and determine whether any of these children's memories were so infected by bad interviewing that we shouldn't even let them testify in court. And the Essex County prosecutor said, oh, wow, dodge the bullet, we'll just try it again. Um, but you know what? It took many, many years just to get reversed in the Supreme Court. The kids were now teenagers. The parents did not want to go through this again. It was uh, unclear what might happen uh, in the future. Uh, they could've, she could have been acquitted. She could have been convicted. She could have been convicted of some of it, not all of it, whatever. And it was decided that they would not retry Kelly Michaels. And she was not retried. Uh, however, her case stood for the proposition that when you have preschoolers 
and younger children that if the defense lawyers in a criminal case can show that there was some suggestibility, then the prosecutor has to prove that that suggestibility did not unfairly um, uh, influence the child's memories. And without getting to what that thing would look like, you have to have that kind of hearing if the defense lawyers can show some suggestibility by DCPP, by prosecutors, by police detectives, uh, by any uh, systemic interviews, any interviews by people in the system. And what happened in that original case? Well, you know, the workers and the cops and the prosecutors' detectives said things like this. You know, Gabriella, four-and-a-half-year-old Gabriella, I need to know what happened to you, and lots of the other kids told us what happened to them, and we need you to tell us what happened to us. Or, Gabriella, we're going to stop. I know that you don't want to be here. You told me that, but once you cooperate, then we'll be done, and you don't have to talk with me anymore. Um, another child said, I hate you, to the interviewer, and the interviewer said, no, you, you go home, you really, really like me. Um... <laughs> Twenty-four of the thirty-nine children were handed anatomical dolls before they made any disclosure of abuse. Now, you haven't learned this yet. You may have learned this through your practice. Dolls are demonstration aids. Kids have to say something happened, and we need to be confused about what they're saying, and then we get them the dolls, and they help show us what happened. You don't give a doll who said nothing and say, here, use these dolls, and uh, we're going to hide in the other room and draw conclusions about what you do with the dolls. And I'm not sure that they did that in that case. They've done that in other cases, but I know for sure that uh, most of the kids were given the dolls before they made any disclosure. And current practice and best case practice tells us not a good thing. Um, some children were offered little mini police badges in exchange for incriminating statements. <laughs> now, that Whoever wrote that PowerPoint, I, I integrated these PowerPoints from the national uh, finding words. Uh, that's probably a bit overstated. They probably were told, if you tell us what Miss Kelly did, I can give you one of those little toy badges uh, that you saw out front. Uh, still a bad thing. Very, very bad thing. Um, but I seriously doubt, and it's in the appendix that they said, if you tell me Kelly Michaels put peanut butter on your vagina and made children lick it off, I will give you a police badge. Um, I don't think it was that uh, obvious, uh, but close to it. One child was told, you're looking, you're acting like a baby. This is from the transcript. Gabriella, all your other friends talked to, that I talked to, told me everything that happened. Uh, uh, Billy Falcone told me what happened. Jerry Pasillo told me what happened. Now, I'm saying their names because those are their friends, you know. They know Billy and they know Jerry. I made those names up. That's not the real names. Uh, it, 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 it's more understandable for all of us, and you guys especially, rather than 29C and 32C. You know, Billy and Jerry told me what happened. Now it's your turn to tell. Can you get more direct than this? You don't want to be left out, do you? Boy, I'd hate to have to tell your friends that you didn't want to help them. Now... One thing we have to appreciate about the Essex County Prosecutor's Office in the mid-1980s, this was about 1985, um, they did, obviously, they didn't know what we know now, so it's easy to point a finger. I don't know that we would have done a much better job in 1985 if we had a time machine, because we were beginning to take these cases seriously. This was the beginning of a professional approach to investigating sexual assault of children. So they didn't know what they didn't know in 1985. However, I have to say, this last statement, boy, I'd hate to have to tell your friends that you don't want to help them, in an effort to get a disclosure, seems to be bad in any decade, in any century. Um, but it was said, and it was problematic. You know, Gabriella, your mommy tells me that you guys are interested in busting this case wide open with us. Is that right? That's why I need your help especially you older kids, because you can talk better than the younger kids. And you will be helping to keep her in jail longer. This way she doesn't hurt anybody. Now, what are you communicating to the child in that statement? Uh, it seems so obvious to us now. What, what are you telling us about Kelly Michaels? 
She's bad. Excellent. What else? You need not, to help. Not only is she bad, but what are we communicating about Kelly Michaels, the, the lady? She's guilty. She's bad. She's guilty. She's guilty, right? You're telling the child, this lady's a bad lady, she's guilty, and she belongs somewhere. Jail. In a cage. In jail. We're going to see a, uh, another laboratory study in a minute by the man who designed it, Professor Stephen Cece at Cornell. Uh, that's called stereotype induction. So you might want to write that down. Stereotype induction. And Cece teaches us about that. With real little kids, if you tell somebody, tell the real little kids that somebody's really bad or a criminal, stereotype induction, the kids will sometimes answer your questions in a way that's consistent with what you said. And I'll tell you more about that when we talk about the Sam Stone study. Uh, just write down stereotype induction, and we'll talk more about that, okay? Stereotype induction is, the word stereotype is when we stereotype somebody, right? Uh, tall people can't spell well. Uh, short people uh, can't write with their left hand, you know? Um, men are bad drivers. That's stereotyping someone, right? So, we'll find out what stereotype induction means, kind of a fancier way to think about stereotyping. Um, and one way we stereotyped Kelly Michaels to the little kids here was to declare her a criminal before we even investigated the case. She belongs in jail longer, so she doesn't hurt anybody. We're telling the kids that Kelly Michaels, as we said it, bad, belongs in jail, right? She's guilty before the kids said anything. And there's a concept known as stereotype induction that teaches us that in certain cases, when we stereotype a person so much and then question little kids about it, they will answer questions in a way that's consistent with the stereotype. You'll know better what I mean by that in a moment. So just think about that, and we'll see the Sam Stone study. How's that for alliteration? Okay. Here's another one. They want the child to disclose. Let's get this done real quick so we can go to King's and get some popsicles. Investigator, did Kelly ever do anything to you with a knife that hurt you? No. Did she ever do bad things or hurt you with a spoon? No. Why don't you show me how you think a little girl can be hurt by this fork? What's the problem with that? Last question. Investigator, the bottom one. What are we asking a kid to do? When you're, when you're doing an investigative interview, you want to know the facts, right? You want to know what really happened. Were to get hurt with a fork, show me what would... Well, what are we asking the little girl to do? Make it up. <laughs> make it up. What? Well, maybe make it up, but certainly assume, uh, a daydream, fantasize, right? This is not the place to be fantasizing, daydreaming, uh, um, uh, thinking up things, making assumptions. Uh, the question here should be, did she do something to you? Uh, if you got to ask a direct question with a fork, yes, tell me all about that, no, it's the end of the questioning. Apparently, they use, they supposedly were penetrated with cutlery, the forks and knives and spoons, and also had to rub peanut butter on each other's genitalia and lick it off, among many other things. So that's why the investigator was asking questions about cutlery. We had a whole second wave of research after the Kelly Michaels case. Because around the country, there was tremendous concern about the impact of bad interviewing on children's memories. And the research that we're going to look at has been given some great weight by many courts around the country. Uh, it's kind of evened out by 2014. Uh, but over the years, especially in the early days, Kelly Michaels was decided in 1993. There was tremendous concern about whether we can protect kids under seven years old anymore because there was tremendous concern about their memories and how they may be influenced by bad questioning. And one of them is the Sam Stone study. I'm going to let you watch Cece talk about it in a moment, but here's where we begin talking about stereotype induction. 
researchers have three to six year old kids, and that's about the Margaret Kelly Michaels age range, right? And the teacher told the little kids in this aftercare program, not today, little ones, but in a couple of weeks, a guy named Sam Stone studied, uh, a, a guy, all these S's, a guy named Sam Stone is coming here. And he's really clumsy, he's a bit of an oaf. But you'll see him when he comes. It's not this week, he'll be here probably next week. The following week, the teacher told the little kids, this guy Sam Stone is coming. He's really clumsy. He's always breaking things. And, but he's going to come and visit us. He's a really nice guy otherwise. Uh, but not this week, little three to six year old. He's going to be coming in a couple of weeks. It's whatever. Finally, Sam Stone comes to the class. Now, he's an actor. This is a lab experiment. Kids don't know that. Sam Stone comes. He smiles at the children. He says hello. Walks around the classroom. Looks at everything, smiles, says goodbye, and leaves. He doesn't touch anything, he doesn't break anything, doesn't do anything other than appear. The next day, the kids are questioned, and they're given fictitious evidence. Now, that's the way, that's the, way uh, the prosecutors who um, wrote these PowerPoints characterize it. And that's one way to look at it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. That's a conclusory statement. They were shown a teddy bear that had chocolate syrup on it. And then they were shown a book that was ripped. And they were asked leading questions about who might have done this. <laughs> Kids were, well, you know Sam Stone did it. See, you're, you got it. They were interviewed for two minutes once a week for four weeks after the visit. After the first interview, one quarter of the children, if there were 100 kids, 25 of them said that's probably Sam Stone. Not that he did it, but probably, right, surmised. They pointed the finger at Sam Stone. Kids were asked leading questions such as, I wonder if Sam Stone was wearing long pants or short pants when he ripped the book. I wonder if Sam Stone got the teddy bear dirty on purpose or by accident. Now, here's my problem with the Sam Stone study. I don't, I don't, you know, you got ecological validity studies, right? Do these kids give a hoot about Sam Stone? No. Is Sam Stone analogous to their father or grandpapa? No, Sam Stone is even less. At least the clown made some animals for you. You might even like the clown. He might have been a nice fella. The Sam Stone did nothing. You know, nobody's got any connection or affinity for Sam Stone. So that has, you know, you got major ecological validity problems. It certainly wasn't a traumatic event, all the things we've talked about. But it talks about stereotyping and induction. They said he was clumsy and oaf many, many times before he actually came. And they, they pointed the finger at Sam Stone. But the problem with these questions is, I wonder if Sam Stone was wearing long pants or shorts pants when he ripped the book. How might a kid process that? Well, yeah, that he did it, but how might they process the question, the little kids? That when he did it, he was wearing, it was about... What question? See, the, the, it, the people who made this study want us to conclude. Just look at the first question. I they, wonder if Sam know, Stone... They, they, they're saying that he did rip the book, but... Was he wearing long pants or short pants when he did it? But he did rip the book. Right. And are the children, by answering that question, long, short, or I don't remember, are the kids saying Sam Stone ripped the book? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Maybe. I wonder if Sam Stone was wearing long pants or short pants when he ripped the book. That's the question. So the kid automatically... What question is the kid answering? Was it long, long, long pants, pants or short pants? Or short pants? Well, he's wearing long pants or short pants. But you were onto something. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I forgot. Well, the kid, my question to you was, what question are the kids answering? No, I'm, the kid is automatically assuming that he did rip the book. Right, and... That the, the interviewer knows that Sam Stone... Right, 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 right. The kid may be saying, hey, these guys figured out who done it. Now they need my help. Was he wearing <laughs> long pants or short pants, right? And that's the question. The question is, what kind of pants was he wearing? Okay, good. There could be, the, the kids are right. If he was wearing shorts and they said shorts, they're right. If he's wearing long pants, they're right. If he said he, I don't remember, they're right. But because no, I was just concerned, okay. sorry. Is that question coming after they've been asked who ripped the book? That's a good question. We don't know. We don't know uh, what the context of that question is. Um, and and if, if, if the kid already said, I saw it, Sam Stone ripped it, and then they asked it, then my criticism doesn't hold water. But if, if this was question was asked haphazardly, as one of many questions, then the kids could say to themselves, well, these grown-ups figured out who did it. They just want to know what kind of pants he was wearing, because that's the question. Go ahead. But I was going to say, because they saw Sam Stone once, you know what I mean? They're going to remember, all, all of the answers are going to be the same, because he went to the class one time. So if that day he was wearing 
you know, long pants, they're going to be like, oh, it's long pants. So they assume now he, he did this thing on the day that he went to class. Right, and that, that's kind of the, the tacit understanding among all of them, that this happened the day Sam Stone came. Uh, I wonder if Sam Stone got the teddy bear dirty on purpose or by accident. Again, you know, they're holding that up to be a major uh, uh, example of children's recollections being influenced and, and, and making an erroneous statement about Sam Stone doing something. But again, what's the question? And it all goes back to context, too. What's the question the kid's answering here? Right. What his motives were, not whether he did it. Again, in isolation, the kid might be saying to themselves, pardon me, well, they already know Sam Stone did it. You know, maybe they got fingerprints uh, or something. Uh, now they want to know if he did it on purpose or by accident. So they're asked to speculate about whether he did it on purpose or accident. And the kid already assuming that Sam is clumsy and he trips over things. So they're more than likely just going to be like, yeah, that was him. He did it on purpose. Was he clumsy? Well, clumsy, clumsy and oafishness and that speaks yeah. more to purposeful stuff or accidental stuff. Do you think they'd probably be more likely to say it was an accident? It was an accident. Because, because clumsy people don't do things on me. purpose, right? We don't knock vases over. But you're right. The, uh, forgetting about what they may or may not say, who knows? You hit the nail right on the head for what we're examining here. What is the impact of all those statements that Sam Stone is clumsy or oafish or whatever? And you were just saying to me... The fact that we did that over and over again is probably going to make them think he did it on purpose. I suggest probably think on accident. But either way, um, it has the potential to influence their conclusions because we've been beating it into their heads that he's a clumsy guy. But he didn't do anything clumsy. That's just stereotyping Sam Stone. There's your stereotype induction. The kids answered questions about Sam Stone in a way that was consistent with him being a clumsy guy. And you'll see video of these kids. Here's ecological validity. I mentioned it many, many times, and Sam Stone lacks it as well. But that doesn't mean it's bad science. It's still, we can learn something from it. I believe that if you stereotype somebody, okay, over and over again, if you do that, children will respond to that. I believe that. That's me, Del Russo. I believe stereotyping calling Margaret Kelly Michaels bad and a criminal and, 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 and evil and belongs in jail. Uh, I think all those things impact uh, vulnerable children's recollections. Now, ecological validity, there's your, we talked about it. We don't need to revisit that. We're going to visit Sam Stone again in a moment. Now we're trying to get a little bit more ecologically valid here. They do another experiment where kids had a medical exam and they got an inoculation. So now if we're concerned about trauma, we're concerned about hyper-anxiety among children, we're concerned that that aspect of the experiment be consistent with what kids experience when they're molested, I'm not saying that getting a shot is the same as getting sexually penetrated. What I am saying is they're more analogous than a clown making balloon animals. <laughs> You know, there's not much anxiety at all in that context unless you've got clown issues. Um, but the, the inoculation study gets closer to that. It's certainly a, a, a kind of environment where people can be anxious. Uh, these kids, four and five, had a medical exam. After the exam, a researcher stayed, um, and they got an oral vaccine and a shot, and a doctor gave them the shot. Uh, the researcher took the child to the waiting room and played. Uh, these kids were asked 11 months later... Um, questions about what happened. And they were interviewed four times over a two-week period. So no questions for 11 months. Remember, they're the little ones, four and five. Almost a year later, they go, hey, remember that time? I've got to imagine they can even remember that time, you know, <laughs> going at that age. And they interviewed the kids four times over a two-week period. And they were lied to about who was the researcher, <coughs> who was the pediatrician, in the fourth interview, 40% of the kids falsely reported the duties of one of the players. Uh, they said the research assistant gave them the shot and the pediatrician's the one who played with them. You know, but those are not major issues. I'm not so sure why the people who wrote the study think that's that much of a big deal. Um, but there were, um, uh, there was significant confusion almost a year later about who did what and how it happened. And um, uh, uh, a significant amount of the kids... Um, 
uh, made statements that were erroneous, uh, mistaken, some could say false, um, uh, almost a year later uh, that were just wrong. The next study is called the mousetrap study. Now, you don't have to remember all these studies, okay? What you need to remember is stereotype induction, right? And what you need to remember is the general concept that when we ask kids leading questions uh, and misleading questions, it, it could influence their recollections. We don't need to remember 23% in that one and 65% in that one and a clown made animal. No, forget about all that. I will, I will question you about studies in general, teach us certain things. The mousetrap study is one of the more interesting ones. Again, we're dealing primarily with preschoolers, young as three years old, three to six years old. They were given a list of events, some were true and some were false, and they were encouraged to try to recall. And what Professor Sisi was concerned about here was some therapists in the 1980s were telling kids that they believed may have been sexually abused to think about being sexually abused. Think about in your mind. Picture in your head if Grandpapa came in your room and did something. Just think about the things he could have done. Did Grandpapa ever come, you know, and, and, the, and the mental health professionals were encouraging kids to think about these things when there was never a disclosure. So CC and his colleagues, among many things, were concerned about this. So they came up with an experiment that was designed to speak to the therapist's strategy of asking kids to think about if this happened or not. Not because the kids said it happened, but think about if Grandpa came in your room, what kinds of things might he do when you were sleeping and Mommy was in the other room? Um, and that kind of strategy came under a great deal of scrutiny, and so much so that Cece designed the study. That's the professor from Cornell that we'll meet in a little bit. He's got a barley mustache. He used to have a mustache. A little bit of a walrus-looking mustache. But anyway, the kids are given a list of events that never happened. They were made up. You know, uh, the, the time you went to the Giants game, uh, the time that you went hot air ballooning. I make it, this is something they could do with us. The time you went zip lining. Imagine what, how you might feel if you went zip lining. If I told you adults to think about these things, close your eyes and, and picture in your head what it would be like to go zip lining. You know? uh, well, that's what they did to the kids. And one of the scenarios was, imagine you got your finger caught in a mouse trap. Think about that. What would be the pictures in your head? And the kids would go, well, I never got my finger caught in a mouse trap. Well, what might happen if you really did get your finger caught in a mouse trap? They did this, okay, over many, many weeks, week after week after week after week. I think it was for a dozen weeks. But by the 10th week, 58% of the children produced one false event, and 25% of the children produced all false events. Okay? One quarter of the kids agreed near the end, by the 12th week, that, yeah, I got my finger caught in a mousetrap, yeah, I went to a hot air balloon thing, yeah, I went here, yeah, it all happened. <laughs> kids were interviewed once per week for a dozen weeks for 30 minutes. They were told to play the picture in a head game. In the 12th session, they were told that there were mistakes. Nevertheless, 43% remembered the false event. Forget about Jack and Mac. Now, having said that, we're going to watch a video now for about 15 minutes. And you'll see the person who designed the Sam Stone study. You'll see the person who designed the mousetrap study. You'll see the children in the Sam Stone study and the children in the mousetrap study. Um, as well as another study was done by a woman named Maggie Bruck from up at McGill University in Canada. She does a study about anatomical dolls. And her pet peeve was that the dolls are dangerous with kids. I don't agree with that. Well, they are dangerous if you don't use them correctly. Very dangerous if you don't use them correctly. But if you use them correctly, they're a wonderful tool for helping kids remember stuff. So let us use this thing here. Any questions about what I talked about already? No, right. This is called Out of the Mouth of Babes. We're going to show you some very important and startling videotapes. What you see could have a dramatic impact on the lives of thousands of people. Men and women accused of child abuse on the word of young children. When children tell stories of being sexually abused by adults, 
Should we believe them? There's now convincing scientific evidence that the answer is not necessarily. Now, there's no question about it. Some children will always tell the truth, and child abuse is a reality. But what researchers are proving is that some kids can be influenced to make up and then actually believe stories that never really happened. And tonight you'll see this with your own eyes. As John Stossel reports, the findings could change the outcome of sexual abuse cases which rest on a child's testimony. In Lowell, Massachusetts, Shirley Susan watches while her husband Ray tends well, his vegetable garden. These people want Looks to like cover a news week. I remember reading the Susan's article. Life is it was Grandma and Grandpa. A half a dozen no one wanted to believe they were guilty. Several times a day, the phone rings because the State Department of Corrections wants each of them to face the camera attached to the phone. Shirley Susan, 285 Princeton Boulevard, Lowell, Mass. The Susas are prisoners in their home. They're under house arrest part of the 9 to 15 year sentence they received for molesting their two grandchildren. The first charges came in a letter from the district attorney. I came home from work and I, I walked in and Raymond said, I, I wasn't going to show this to you, but um, you better look at it. And I, I couldn't believe it when, when I looked and I read it. I just... Can you imagine myself or any human being putting your head in a vagina or sticking toes there? touching different places or putting a fist up their anus. It just wouldn't make it. Wouldn't there be some sort of serious damage? Wouldn't you notice right away? Every year, thousands of people like the Sousas are convicted of child abuse, even though there's no direct physical evidence. They're convicted simply on the word of four- and five-year-old kids. Conventional wisdom is that kids that age wouldn't make such things up. They simply don't know enough about sexuality to come up with detailed accounts of sexual abuse. But then Cornell University professor Stephen Cece read the testimony of some well-known molestation cases and concluded that interviewers had led the kids on by asking suggestive questions. The interviewers could say, how else can we get this information out? Because the, the kids won't volunteer it. The problem is that from a research standpoint, we are now discovering that if you put kids who were not abused through the same kind of highly leading, repetitive interview, some of those children will also disclose events that seem credible, but in fact are not born in actuality. Now others have suspected this, but Cece decided to test that theory. He set up an experiment known as the Sam Stone study. He told a classroom full of four, five, and six-year-olds that a man named Sam Stone would come to their class and that he was very clumsy. Then the man came in, stayed a few minutes, and left. That's it. He didn't do anything clumsy. Then, four times in the next few months, half the kids were asked leading questions about the man's visit. Do you remember when Sam Stone came to the school and he broke that toy? Did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? Well, he didn't break a toy. So it's, it's, it's highly suggestive, erroneously suggesting questioning. After that, another interviewer was simply asked, I wasn't there that day, and I want to know everything that happened at David Sandstone King's visit. Can you tell me what happened? This little boy said Sam Stone was reading a book during the visit to the classroom. He was doing it so fast that he ripped one of the pages. <laughs> really? This girl said Sam Stone threw dolls and books in the air while he was in the class. Well, when your teacher saw that he was throwing things in the air, what did she say? You need to go. You need to go? Yeah, but keep on looking at stuff. Just asking leading questions inspired most of the kids to make stories up. In real life cases, though, are the investigators as suggestive as your testers are? What we do is a pale version of what happens in real cases. Uh, it doesn't come close, for example, to what was done in the Kelly Michaels case. The Essex County Prosecutor's Office says 26-year-old Margaret Kelly Michaels is a manipulative, sadistic child. Preschool teacher Michaels was convicted of molesting 19 children, molesting them in bizarre ways in the middle of this crowded New Jersey school without any teacher or parent noticing anything. She served five years in jail until this year when her conviction was overturned by an appeals court that questioned the reliability of the children's testimony. 
One day you're getting ready for work, making coffee, minding your business, trying to get along as best you can, being a reasonable, decent, honorable citizen, and the next minute you are an accused child molester with the most bizarre... I, I've never even heard of such things even being done. They say you inserted objects including Lego blocks, forks, spoons, serrated knives into their anuses, vaginas, And a penises, sword. <laughs> and a <Yeah>. sword. <laughs> that you made children drink your urine, that you made kids take their clothes off and lick peanut butter off them. It's very hard to believe, yet the jury believed it, and not you. No one is willing to doubt the child. And um, I think that's how the state won their case. They didn't have to present a credible case of how it could happen, or recreate the scene of the crime, or, or even present any witnesses, but just they knew they'd send these little children saying, yes, Kelly was a bad person and she hurt me at this school, that no one would dare um, question that. She has a point. This past decade has seen a skyrocketing number of molestation claims, often against family members like the Sousas and against daycare operators like McMartin in California and Little Rascals in North Carolina. All these cases are based primarily on the word of children who, after the fact, had repeatedly been asked questions like this. Do you remember that time when this asked you to stick his penis in your mouth? Okay. Um, None of the child abuse investigators would agree to be interviewed for this story. Some clearly go too far. You're pressing your pee, -pee against me, though. Know. Yeah, it feels good when you do that. I didn't burn. Maybe, is that what they did, too? Steve Cece said the questioning in the Kelly Michaels case was just as leading as this. They say to the child, we want you to tell us what Kelly did. The kid says, I don't remember. Oh, yes, you do. You remember. No, I don't remember. You do so. We know you remember. At this point, the child's crying. I want to get out of here. You're not going anywhere to tell us what we know you want, what we know you know. You basically were barraged with questions and coerced, manipulated, begged, made to feel guilty. Um, it just was disgusting. But where would the kids come up with saying things like, she put the knife in my vagina, or she covered me with peanut butter? Mm -hmm. Children have incredible imaginations. And it's not out of the realm. Anybody who's a parent who's honest knows what kids are capable of saying. Ray and Shirley were astonished when they heard their grandchildren's testimony. They said that we used the machine as big as this whole house on them to violate them. We had a cage in the cellar that we locked them up. Never produced. Nothing. But why would kids make such things up? That's what convinces juries. You hear those stories and you say, okay, maybe it's not all true. Maybe the machine wasn't as big as a house. Maybe Kelly Michaels didn't smear them all with peanut butter. Teachers would have smelled that. But there must be some truth to it. How could children come up with so many inventive, kinky activities and describe them with so many details unless something really happened? It's a persuasive argument until you hear about CeCe's next experiment. He had researchers ask four and five-year-olds to pick a card out of a deck of ten. On each card was a question. Okay, Derek. This one says, have you ever seen a baby alligator eating apples on an airplane? No. No? Have you ever had your finger caught in a mousetrap and had to go to the hospital? No. No? At first, almost all the kids say no. But then, once a week, for the next ten weeks, they ask the question again. No coercion, no leading questions, as in child abuse cases. They just gently repeat the question. You went to the hospital because your finger got caught in a mousetrap. Did that happen? Uh-huh. Yeah? By week four, or six, or ten, most of the kids are saying, yes, it happened. And not just saying yes, but giving such precise information about it that you'd think it must have happened. Did it hurt? Yeah. Yeah? Who took you to the hospital? Mm, my daddy, my mommy, my brother. So where in your house is the mousetrap? It's, it's up at the, down in the basement. Down in the basement? What is it next to in the basement? It's next to the firewood. Anyway, what you see here is a child who's giving you a lot of perceptual detail. He's telling you where the mousetrap was. It, was. it was next to a wood pile in the basement. He had gone down there because he wanted to tell his dad, who was down there collecting firewood, that he was ready for lunch. 
He gets an argument with his brother Colin, which he, he later goes on to describe. They were fighting over some action figure. Colin pushes him next to the wood pile. He doesn't see where his hand's going, and it gets caught in the mousetrap. Were you surprised at the answers you got? I think it's fair to say that my colleagues and I were absolutely shocked that by the 10th week, not only were they assenting to some of these things that didn't occur, but they were giving very coherent narratives, highly elaborated narratives that are, I think, quite persuadable. By the time I met the same boy, it was weeks after the experiment, but he still could give lots of convincing details about things that never happened. Was there a time when, when you got your finger caught in a mouse trap and had to go to the hospital? Uh, which, which finger was it? Remember, this is the result after a researcher simply asked the question once a week for 10 weeks. In real abuse cases, kids are questioned for years, often by parents, doctors, then by the investigator, perhaps a therapist, then by lawyers. Who went with you to the hospital? Um. My mom and my dad and my brother Colin, but not my baby. It was in my mom's tummy. Baby this boy's right. testimony is even more remarkable, because just a few days earlier, his father had discussed the experiment with him. He explained that it was just a test, and the whole mousetrap event had never happened. The boy agreed it was just in his imagination. Still, listen to this. Let me ask you, did your father tell you something about... The mousetrap finger story. No, it is, it, is it true? Did it really happen? It a story. It, it really happened. It's really happened. You really got your finger caught. It's really happened. Yeah. I, I assume the child isn't lying. They aren't intentionally making up stories. Absolutely. I think they've come to believe it. It is part of their belief system. Some experts believe they come closer to the truth using anatomically correct dolls. With dolls, they wouldn't have to ask so many questions. But Cece's colleague, Dr. Maggie Brooke, conducted tests that led her to conclude using dolls also leads kids on. I would think anatomically correct dolls would be a good, neutral way to ask questions. I thought the, same, the very same way, but I'm, after having had this experience, I'm not quite sure how you do that. Brooke had this pediatrician add some extra steps to his routine physical examination of preschool kids. He measures the child's wrists with a ribbon. He puts a little label on the child's stomach, and he tickles the child's foot with a stick. Never does the doctor go anywhere near the child's private parts. Then, right after the exam, using an anatomically correct doll, Brooke asks leading questions about the doctor's exam. Can you show me how the doll, how Dr. Emmett touched your vagina? No, he didn't. He didn't. The child tells the truth. But just a few days later, Dr. Brock and the child's father again ask about the doctor's visit. It's a different story. Before Brock has a chance to even bring out the doll, the child shows how the doctor had strangled her with the ribbon. <laughs> you, put a, you put that around your neck. Right. What the? Right. So tight. And watch what happens when the doll's brought out. She's asked to explain what the doctor did that day. So what did he do? Oh. He put a stick in your vagina? Yeah. Just like that? It gets even more violent. She claims the doctor hammered the stick into her vagina. Then she shows how the doctor examined her. He was where? My honey. He did look in your honey? Of course, none of it is true. Dr. Brooke found that when dolls were used, half the kids who'd never had their private parts touched claimed the doctor had touched them. These tests make Dr. Brooke question some of the recent testimony by children in court. Do you think there are dozens of people in jail now who are totally innocent? Yes, I do. The researchers' findings are only beginning to be heard in courtrooms. Most prosecutors still argue that children wouldn't lie. Prosecutors want to put Kelly Michaels back in jail. In a few months, they plan to retry her with the same charges. I will fight to the end um, because I am an innocent woman, and I can look anyone in the eye, and I've had to fight for the rest of my life, and I will do that. So I'm prepared for whatever will happen. You don't sound scared. No, I'm not scared. I'm angry and I'm outraged, but I'm not scared. The Sousas are planning an appeal of their own. 
like Kelly Michaels, they believe a day will come when the courts and their grandchildren realize the truth. When those kiddos grow up, when they become adults, they're going to realize that these things never happen between Shelly and I and them. And I know that they're going to, they're going to realize that. It's their bright children. And they have a mind of their own. Well, nobody's prompting them when they grow up. They can remember and will embrace. Well, John, you know, I'm, I remember I first worried about this sort of thing after some of the early cases that we reported. But children can be so convincing. How do we separate out when they're telling the truth from when they're not? There is no good way. There are all kinds of experts who will testify in court as paid expert witnesses, and they often say they can tell. But Dr. Cece ran a test where he showed them tapes of kids, some of them were lying, some were not. And the experts would say, oh, I can tell. But what they said was wrong half the time, in fact, more than half the time. So they did worse than chance. Clearly, there are real cases of sexual abuse of children, and we have to address that. Yes, and, and Dr. Sisi won't testify on behalf of the defense because he's afraid he'll let a real molester off because of this. But it's important not to influence the children, and Sisi says to test an alternative hypothesis. In other words, to ask the child, well, Joe did this to you, and then what did Jane do to you? If the child starts talking about more people, then at least you have a reason to be suspicious. Thank you, John. Well, next, for more than 11 years, she was one of the most powerful women in the world. Now the former British Prime Minister is talking candidly about America's president, then and now, about the tough decisions and her own future. Margaret Thatcher, after this. Save right now. Buy three Goodyear tires at the regular price. Get the fourth tire free. That's right. Buy any three of these Goodyear tires at the regular price and get the fourth free. Four for three now. Hurry. Savings end soon. Today, a lot of credit cards charge you fat interest rates. <laughs> Discover Card has changed all that. I never followed up on, I'm not sure what happened to those grandparents, how their case was resolved, but, you know, I'm not so sure. None of that stuff had anything to do with the grandparents' case, right? They were just, um, they talked about the studies, they talked about the grandparents being on the bracelet mm -hmm. and some of the allegations. The Kelly Michaels case, we all know what happened to her in her case. Her case was eventually dropped. Did she sue the state? Uh, I don't think she ever sued the state, um, and I'm not so sure she would have won because then they would have to try the case in civil court, and she's much more likely to get convicted in civil court. Was there any like, children regarding that case that were not asked leading questions, and was there anything to believe, like anything at all ever to believe that she really did any of that? The, um, the parents and the prosecutors my recollection is that there were there was a subgroup of maybe five or six kids that were really uh, persuasive and they had good evidence from and they weren't part of the um, forensic interviews. I think a couple of the parents would not allow their kids to be interviewed by DIFUS or excuse me the prosecutor's office. Um, so again, I, I don't know the answer directly to your question, but I know that there was a strong feeling that there were some untainted kids, if you will. Um, in the Kelly Michaels case. But you saw the Sam Stone study, right? And how he talked about that, the stereotyping, and um, you know how he came in and simply walked around the room. And you saw the boy in the mousetrap study, uh, even yeah. after his dad told him that it was an experiment and none of these things really happened. What did yeah. the boy say? It really, it really happened. happened. It wasn't a story. It wasn't a story. <laughs> right. And, you know, as Cece says after that, he... he uh, concludes that the boy um, truly believes that he got his finger caught in a mousetrap now that it has become part of his belief system, as Cece says. And that is 
the most troubling at all of all the things that we learned from some of these studies. That is, if the kid believes that it really happened, um, he can be very persuasive because it's become part of his memory bank. It's it's as if it really happened, and you know he can recount what happened in a way that seems sincere and genuine because it is sincere. That's what's in his brain. And that is a classic example of something that I harped on last week and a little bit the week before, something called what, what? What was that concept I talked about? Source? Misattribution. Excellent. That boy and his experience is a perfect example of source misattribution because he has a memory of getting his finger caught in a mousetrap. He was fighting with his brother Colin. They were arguing over some action figure. It happened in the basement of their home near a wood pile that they had firewood. And he caught this finger in the mousetrap and he had to go to the doctor and it had to be taken care of at the hospital. Um, so the boy has a memory. However, the source of it is wrong. Source misattribution. The boy's attributing the source from having really gotten his finger caught, caught in a mousetrap where we know that the source of his recollection is from the interview process, 100%, because we created it. The experiment created the idea that there was a mousetrap incident. So his experience is an example of source misattribution. Would that be the same for the girl that went to the doctor and the doctor did all these things to her? Yes, that's another example of um, if that girl believes that the doctor hammered something into her and, and did all those things, that would be an example of source misattribution. Now, if you think about what you just witnessed, uh, the manner in which the little girl, uh, and they did a bunch of kids when it came to anatomical dolls, that was Dr. Bruck at, at McGill University. That is not the way you interview a child. What was the context in which the interview happened with the dolls? It was, seemed to be an open room, or father was there, or another guy, there were toys all over the floor, there were hammers and sticks and Legos and other things. I mean, you know, I would imagine that even in the mid-80s we would know that that doesn't seem to be a good environment to question children in. Um, and it speaks to how we now deal with the dolls. One of the things that we emphasize with the forensic interview, and especially with anatomical dolls, is that these, these dolls are not toys. We don't play with them. They're not like the dolls that you play with, whoever the child may be. You need to communicate that to the child when using anatomical dolls and stress that this is serious business. It's not playtime. Uh, it's the time to talk about the truth, and the truth is what really happened. Um, you need to remove all distractions. I mean, th th that scenario was the opposite of removing distractions. There were a bunch of toys to play with. And the fact that it was conducted in a context where there were many toys does the opposite. It, it, it communicates to the child that this is fun and games in a way. And, uh, and then the child just was chaining. You know, we call that chaining. She was just thinking of one thing, stream of consciousness. And then, uh, oh, there's a hammer. And then he hammered it in me. And... Uh, and he put me on a wheel, you know, and she was just riffing. Uh, so um, uh, that's not the way we use dolls. And uh, Maggie Bruck says, uh, I really believe there are people in jail who are innocent because of the dolls. And John Stossel was the reporter from ABC News who says, well, don't you think that dolls can be good to help some kids communicate, or words to that effect? And she says, I'm just not sure how you do that. Well, there is a way to do that, and I'm not sure what she would say now, um, what her feelings are about anatomical dolls. I suspect that she's still against their use. Um, you know, but there, are, there is a way to do that. If you use them properly, you use them after there's a disclosure, you communicate emphatically to the child, uh, that these dolls are not to play with, they're to help me communicate. Um, um, I think there is a way to use the dolls appropriately. And remember, we're dealing with a class of kids. Uh, almost always, all the kids in these experiments were between three and six. You know, so we're dealing with a, with a class of children that know more than they can tell. 
the memory's there, they just don't have the verbal ability, they don't have the fun, the universe of words and language and life's experience to communicate what happened to them. And dolls are a way that kids can uh, communicate. As long as they're used properly, it is another way that children can communicate, especially the smallest children who do not have the developmental capability to communicate mm -hmm. in, in any degree of detail about sexual abuse. Can you go back just for a moment? Sure. When you were talking about, you said source, what yeah. was the other word? Misattribution. So source misattribution. Source misattribution and source monitoring. Excellent question. Source monitoring is the ability to think about where you ex where you learned information. Okay, so source monitoring is like a monitor. A monitor pays attention to things, right? They they listen for things. When we were kids, you had the hall monitor, right? The lunchroom monitor. The lunchroom's monitor was to pay attention to things. So when we get to source monitoring, we're talking about the ability for a human to monitor the source of their recollection, the source of their memories. We as adults may have a very good recollection of the Super Bowl that happened three weeks ago, but we're able to figure out that we weren't actually at the Super Bowl, or last night was the Academy Awards. Uh, we have a great memory, if you watched it, of the Academy Awards and who, you know, who fell and stripped on our dress and you know, who mispronounced the name and, or who delivered pizza to the, to the attendees. The Oscars, yeah. As grown-ups, we have a pretty good recollection if you watch the Academy Awards. I just watched clips of it. Uh, um, but... Before the show last year. Well, actually, she fell again this year, they said, on the red carpet. Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence, yeah. Her and Sam Stone might be dating. You never know, man. <laughs> But source monitoring, back to that, is we as adults are, are pretty good at saying ourselves, we weren't at the Academy Awards, we watched it on TV, right? We're good at figuring out where, where the memory is of the pizza being delivered or the J Jennifer Lawrence falling. We, we, we're good at saying, hey, I, I wasn't there. I remember that because I watched it on TV. Little kids, especially as time go by, goes by, they're not good at source monitoring. They're not good at paying attention to whether they actually lived it or they saw it on TV or mommy suggested it to them. For example, I give you that perspective where the, I supposedly stuck the key in the outlet when I was a little kid. If you asked me when I was seven, you know, why I remember that, I would probably say because it happened. I was there. Uh, I now know as an adult, because I'm a lot better at source monitoring. I can figure out what the source of stuff is. That I don't remember that happening. I remember it because my mom kept saying it. So that's source monitoring. And when we get it wrong, that's source misattribution. If you think of that term as source mistake, and that's a fancy way of saying source mistake, source being where you got that memory from, from having lived it or watched it or somebody said it to you. That's the source of it. You know, where do our memories come from? And um, little Billy, with his finger caught in a mouse trap, he's not good at source monitoring. He really believes that the source of the memory, when he closes his eyes, he sees himself fighting with Colin, and he sees himself getting his finger caught in a mouse trap, and he sees himself going to the hospital. It's in his brain. But he's not good at figuring out that the source of that memory is because the interviewer asked them the question every week for three months. Yeah, come on. But my question yeah. is, what is the difference? Because I'm hearing the same thing. Source monitoring is paying attention to where you got the memory. Source misattribution is being mistaken about it. So they're mu they're much they're different in that sense. So Billy's got a memory of his getting finger caught in a mouse trap, right? You with me? He's got, his, he's got this memory. And now he has to ask himself. So he doesn't do these things, but when we interview kids and they report past information to us, that's the process that's happening. So when we ask him about getting his finger caught in a mouse trap, he tells us. He doesn't know where he has that memory from. He doesn't know because he's not capable of doing it because little kids are poor at source monitoring. So he doesn't understand where he got that memory from. He thinks he really lived it, and he didn't. So he's bad, he's not good at source monitoring. If he says to us, 
I have this memory of getting my finger caught in a mousetrap. It's because the lady asked me questions about it over and over again. But not because I lived it, because it really didn't happen. I know that. Then he wouldn't make a source misattribution. He got it right. His memory is the result of the questioning. So source misattribution is... Not being able. It's the actual act it's of the... Of saying it. When you okay. say it happened and you got it wrong, that's source mistake. Substitute source mistake for source monitoring. So when Billy says, when John Stossel says, you know, your dad told me that this didn't really happen. You remember that part in the video? N no, it, it, it's not a story. It really did happen. He, he got it wrong. He made a mistake. Well, we know what happened. It, it's not a sto it is a story. It never happened. So he made a source mistake. That's a source misattribution. When Billy says, I have this memory because my finger was actually, in fact, truthfully caught in a mousetrap, he got it wrong. That's a source mistake. Or source misattribution is what they call it, the fancy way to say it. And source mistakes arise out of poor source monitoring. Um, so they're two different things. Source monitoring is paying attention to where your memories come from. And source misattribution is being mistaken about the memory. Does that clear it up a little bit? You know what the, it is? The reading that you gave us, what I'm reading, is describing source misattribution, but it's saying source monitoring. Read me the statement and we'll tease it apart. What did it say? Uh, preschool children sometimes have difficulty remembering how they acquired information. Consequently, they may not be able to distinguish information they directly experienced from information they were told about. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not good at source monitoring. Right. But I guess what I'm trying to understand, the only difference is that Source misattribution is the actual act of speaking or saying the source monitoring. So source monitoring is really like the definition of a theory as opposed to an actual act of them actually repeating the information from the wrong source or identifying it from the wrong well, source. Well, the act of repeating the information from the wrong source, those are your words now, yeah. we'll focus on that, that's source misattribution. The act of repeating the information okay. from the wrong source, I mean your words, that's source misattribution. Okay. The act of saying it and getting it wrong is source misattribution. Source monitoring is paying attention to generally where you got information from, you know. Um, if let me, if I told you so what an outsider identifying the misattribution would be source monitoring. Yes, an outsider would use the term source misattribution. Looking at no, no, no. I'm saying is source monitoring, like is source monitoring me telling you no, you didn't stick the key in the socket. Your mother told you that. Well. Yes, you can be a source monitor, an outsider can be a source monitor, but usually source monitoring is done by the person themselves trying to figure it out. Let me just The person themselves identifying that they got the sources incorrect. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. If they realize they got it incorrect, then they're poor at source monitoring. But source monitoring is something we all do. Let me just give you a little different example, maybe make it a little bit easier. You're studying for Freed's exam in a little while, right? I told you what the definition of, um, what did we talk about, P P P PSLs. I talked to you about parole supervision for life, okay? And suppose I said parole supervision for life only happens to women who are accused of sexual abuse, right? Then you took the exam and you wrote that down, right? And then Freed corrects and goes, you got that wrong. That's crazy. That's not true. And you say, no, Freed, you told me that. No, you got it wrong. The source of that kooky statement is Del Russo. So that's source misattribution. If afterwards you argue with Freed and go, Freed, you, ta you taught us that only women could be on parole supervision for life. Freed goes, no, I didn't. Say, yes, you did. That is source misattribution. You made a mistake about the source of that knowledge. 
Your ability to remember whether Freed told you or Del Russo told you is source monitoring. Your ability to go back and rewind and go, who told me that? You know, I'm not so good at remembering stuff. Well, I that's got, what I'm saying, yeah. being able to identify that you made a mistake. Is source monitoring. Right. Yeah. And mis source misattribution is the act of You got it. it. That's it. So exactly. So would my post be correct or incorrect? Oh, I don't know. What's your post? What oh, you graded it. It says, I use the term source monitoring. Were you cross-examining me and backing me into a corner to try to squeeze the no, point? I just wanted to make no, sure I don't know. I'm teasing. If I did something correctly. wrong, I'll correct it. What no, 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 no. I want to know because, like, when you asked, when you were saying source, when you were asking us what was the term source misattribution, yeah. I immediately said source monitoring because that's what I used in my post last night okay. and, or the other night, whatever. So I Did you post sure twice? I That's why you got one point. No, but that's not my question. Okay. I want to make sure that I use the term correctly. I'll look. I use source monitoring. Okay, so I'll take I a look at it. I'll take a look at it. But I'll tell you what, the last way you stated it is 100% right and well stated. You said the, the act of paying attention is monitoring and the act of so doing it, the behavior is source mistake or source misattribution. So then I should have used source misattribution because I said that... The witnesses, um, I forgot how I worded it. But well, let's take a look at it later because we're taking time away. I'll look at it. I don't know whether you said it right or wrong. We'll take a look at it. Okay, so what are the lessons learned from all of these experiments? Gentlemen, ladies? Stereotyping. Yeah, don't stereotype the perp. Good. Obviously, do not tell the child the answer. What about multi-victim cases? Why are they different? What, what's typical, excuse me, in a multi-victim case? Different. What do you mean? Well, it says be wary, be wary or be on patrol or watch out with multi-victim cases. Now, in Margaret Kelly Michaels, was, I think it was 40 victims, let's say. It's a lot. The more victims, the more chance that they're going to talk. The less, like, I would feel like the last chance... Someone would victimize more victims for the chance of them getting caught yeah. because there's more people that are able to... Yeah, well, let's never underestimate how many people a molester might molest, but there is... I'm not underestimating is, it. But, okay. But there is, uh, if what you're saying is the more victims, the more potential for cross-contamination, more potential for mm -hmm. kids to talk to one another mm -hmm. or their parents to talk to them or another person. No? Go ahead. Talk to me. What happened? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, maybe it can create biases on your perspective. Like, if one child says, yes, I was molested by such and such, that doesn't mean that the child B was also molested. Excellent. That's another, that's, first of all, what you just said is, is relevant, too, because the more victims, there's more information flowing there's more people talking to more kids and more kids talking to one another. We call that cross-contamination. Mm -hmm. When one kid talks to another, that one's, you know, you know how families and parents work. And you know, you hey, uh, 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 Ron Levin, uh, put Mark on the phone. Did your kid tell you something? You hear about that, Kelly Michaels? And everybody's talking and to one another. in the background listening. And that's the point. Even worse. They're on speakerphone. They're listening. So that's a problem. And it's Jennifer. Jennifer? I got the name right? Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer, what did you just observe? Let's, I've got a little... Oh. Um, that it can create bias according yes. to your perspective because if one child says, yes, I was molested by Johnny, mm. that doesn't necessarily mean that child is also molested. Right. So in multi-victim cases, we're going to have, especially if we use the same interviewer, which often happens, we're going to have information from kid A, B, and C, and and be interviewing D, E, and F, and, and what we learn from them may influence the way we approach them, and we may be more biased to believe that Michaels is guilty because we learn this. Yeah, that's a problem in multi-victim cases, too. Go ahead. But in, um, in the Kelly Michaels case, didn't they use that as a way to get the child to tell them whatever? Well, there's the, said, yes. Well, there's the said mm -hmm. such and such. Be wary of multi-victim cases in the sense that what you learn from one kid, it's almost similar to what Jennifer says, but a little different, that... Now you know what one kid says. You may be you may be tempted to use that to as a as a uh, as a bribe, or to influence the other kids to tell you. And that's what they did in that case. Exactly what they did. Yes. So that's a problem too. Go ahead. We can also use it as a problem being not even what they say but what they don't, because then they're 
the other kids are going to be like, if, especially if they're older, they're going to be like, do you know what you're doing to our family kind of a thing? And then there goes the whole... Who was doing to what family? Like I'm, if I'm one following. of the kids was really abused, then they knew about it. That right. whole loyalty component. Right, right. So then the older kids knew the consequences of someone speaking, then they can tell the younger ones or whoever it was, look, see what you're doing, that whole guilt. Okay, so there's more potential for, because there's so many people involved, there's more potential perhaps for the older kids to influence the younger kids, okay. or any kids for that matter, to let them know the consequence or impact of their disclosure, which they might not have ordinarily known mm -hmm. if it was a one-victim case. Right. You know, Miss Kelly could lose her job, and, uh, you know, she may have to go back to Pittsburgh. She's our favorite teacher. She's the best. <laughs> the other thing is here, and this is what happened in Kelly Michaels. There were five kids in the beginning, right? And this happens in, the, and, and, is anyone here assigned to IAIU? No. Anybody ever work in IAIU? A lot of times in IAIU, in institutional cases, you have maybe one kid who told, or two or three kids who told, but when they're in an institutional setting, who else do you have to interview? The rest of the class, the unit, the staff, but I'm talking about the children. You gotta interview the rest of the kids. Now you do this to a smaller extent in what institutional context? You interview the child and who else in a very small universe? The siblings. So, and the siblings, much like the classmates, are people who never disclosed, right? Because you have one kid who disclosed, in the same context as other kids, the same situation, we got to ask them if something happened. And that happens in multi-victim cases all the time. You know, if something happened in his class, we would ask everybody else in the class whether they've seen the same thing or whether they experienced the same thing, as we should. Uh, but once you start doing that, now you're asking questions from kids who never disclosed. So you want to be extra careful that we don't put ideas in those kids' heads. The kid who got his temperature taken, that kid made a statement. Nobody said anything to him. He just said it. It happened. He said it. He made a statement to the pediatrician. The mom was there, and he said it. He made the first disclosure. But when you interview non-disclosing kids, you got to be real careful because they never said anything. That's where we're most likely to put ideas in kids' heads. Their brains are blank slates when it comes to whether Kelly Michaels did something or didn't do something. So be, be wary of multi-victim cases. Never refer to the interview as a game. That must be something to do directly with Kelly Michaels. And you always want to do this. You don't want to assume she's guilty. You don't want to assume anything. But if you have to assume anything, assume that she didn't do it. And rule it out. Say, well, maybe she was just helping them go to the bathroom. Or maybe she, in your brain, I'm thinking. Until, like, you know what? I've asked questions about that. I ruled out bathroom. I ruled out they had, she was helping them put their pants back on, getting them out of their snowsuit. You know, I ruled out everything innocent. All I'm left with is she put her hands on her, their bodies for sexual gratification. Avoid prefixed ideas about the allegation. Go in there with a blank slate. Explore alternative hypotheses. And that's what I just said. Maybe she was simply helping them get out of their snowsuit. Maybe she was helping them go to the bathroom. You know, maybe um, whatever else might be an innocent explanation for the behavior. Young children are more suggestible than adults. One very common attribute of all of these laboratory experiments, what were the age ranges in every experiment? Five, Generally five, speaking. Four to seven. Four to seven, three to six, three to eight, three to seven. I don't think anybody was eight. I think the highest grade age I saw was seven, maybe. So recognize that we have to be extra careful with preschoolers and first graders. And remember that kids 10 and older are no more suggestible than adults. So, you know, all this worries about the mousetrap, you're not going to get many 10-year-olds to believe that they got their finger caught in a mousetrap when it never really happened. If a kid's cognitively impaired, that's different. A normal functioning 10-year-old is, I'd be shocked if you've had the kind of numbers that you had with the mousetrap. And those numbers were disturbing. I forget what it was, something like 30% in the end. Um, and don't put the entire burden of the case on the child. I mean, that's a great lesson here. You know, maybe we can get other evidence. What that is, is hard to come by, but, you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't look. Put it in perspective, the average age of our victims is 10. The median age is 13. That's another way of saying, be careful with the preschoolers. And most if, of our cases happen after there's an, an initial report. They're not kids 
who never disclosed, and we're interviewing them simply because one of their classmates disclosed, most of our kids made, it, made a statement outside somewhere else, and we're following up on that statement, right? Or they engaged in behavior. Now, where do you find yourselves in a situation where you have a kid with a blank slate? The sibling interviews. What would you say, now, how many of you have ever done intake or done this kind of investigative work? Most of you? What would you say, and again, this is just your guess, uh, but in your experience, how many, just give me a percentage guess, just a percentage guess. You have the kid who disclosed to their guidance counselor, and they said, very clear that something happened. You interview them. Now they got three siblings, two siblings, one sibling, whatever. You got to interview the siblings, right? What percentage would you say of siblings who make a subsequent disclosure consistent with the original disclosure? Very low. That's my experience, too. Very low. Kid A tells and you interview sister, brother, B, C, and D. Um, very, very, very rare that they go, uh, I didn't want to tell, but this happened to me, too. Yeah. Or that they knew it was happening to them. That they knew it was happening to the siblings. It's very rare that, and it's very rare that they know it was happening either, or are potential witnesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something else to keep in mind, you know, I, I'm trying to decompress us from watching those startling videos, right? Like, oh my God, is there any hope? Right? Kids, mouse traps, it really happened. Look, he was turning the pages and then he threw it in the air. Some little girl said, he, he ripped one of the pages. Get out. Yeah, you get out. You watch that and you go, man, is there any hope? Well, let's put it in perspective. That's the idea here. Most of our kids already made a report. Most of the abuses in the family. Most of our cases have one victim. You know, and this research is research. It's not the real world. You know, all of these studies can be attacked on the issue of ecological validity. One more time, tell me what ecological validity means. Life. Right. The, the experiment doesn't mirror real life. Yep. As you were talking, all I kept on thinking was all of those were suggestible, right? But then I guess under, you just said the validity of it, it was, for, it was for it to be suggestible. Like yeah, well, in the early studies, they weren't so suggestible. In the later studies, they all were suggestible and had false memory. Not all, but there was a significant amount of false memory, which is troubling. So we just said, geez, what about those studies? One thing is to look at their ecological validity. Nearly all of them are attackable. The other thing is to say, wait a minute, they also all involve preschoolers. They also all involve kids who never made a report. And nobody ever said anything about a mousetrap finger. Just made it up. Um, so is it realistic to design a study with multiple interviews? That's the other thing. You know, we interview, well, the, the suggestion here is, we interview kids. We interview kids maybe once, twice about what happened, right? Maybe the prosecutor's detective does an interview. Have you ever had a case where for three months, once a week, week after 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 week, after week for 12 weeks in a row, we interview a kid about whether daddy touched them in their room or grandpa or that's it, pretty much one time, right? And maybe if it's a little wacky or unclear or the kid's too young, you might send them to their RDTC, see if anything <laughs> shakes out of there. So, you know, um, CC argues that children are subjected to between 4 and 11 interviews. In most cases, they've experienced numerous other bouts of questionings from family members, therapists, social workers, and other interested parties. You know, I think that's overstated. Um, yes, parents may ask them. Yes, we ask them. But, you know, the social workers and other people and the therapists, that comes out later, later on down the road. When you get a referral, that's another important aspect of mandatory, um, uh, what is your 24-hour investigative rules or 48 hours or whatever, immediate response. You know, immediate response deals with this issue. If, if, if the kid told the counselor, even told mommy, and you guys go out right away, or prosecutor's office gets involved and goes out right away with you guys, you know, you, you really nipped it in the bud. It, you, you, don't, you don't do 12 interviews and then there's a disclosure. It's, it happens over sometimes 24-hour period. So this suggestion that there's 11 interviews before we make a decision about going forward is not the real world. Is that your world? Does that happen? A dozen interviews and then you make a call? 
You got, you got another case waiting for you. You're going to be married to this kid for, for three and a half months. Another way to look at these cases, of these studies is, in real world, these are kids, and I said this a little bit differently earlier, these are kids who made a prior statement that they were abused. We're not fishing for disclosures. In the memory and suggestibility interviews, or the studies we looked at, from clowns and doctors and, 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 and mousetraps, they're kids who denied an event. By the way, in the mousetrap study, every child denied the event the first time. Right? Now, I'd like to look at it. It'd be interesting to look at it. Maybe I'll ask the grad assistants to look it up. At what point did these kids adopt these false memories? I wouldn't be surprised if the second time they denied it. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if these false memories didn't start to gel until the fifth or sixth interview. So, but one thing I know for sure is 100% of them in the first week said, to not, no, I think they even showed it. Did you get caught? You said a mouse trap. I think there's a little African-American boy that goes, no. Okay, no. Oh, they ask him, did you ever see an alligator eating something or others? And they ask him a wacky question about alligators. So the memory and suggestibility interviews, which are part of all these studies, are they're kids who denied it. They said it didn't happen. Nearly all of our cases, other than sibling interviews and institutional cases, involve a kid who revealed something. Otherwise, we're not running around looking for victims. we got other fish to fry, right? Some final thoughts, you want to take a look at the follow-up research, you know, there's, there's research that comments on the um, mousetrap studies and others, um, forget about your assignments, that's something else. So it's not as bad as they put it in, and something, something that I observed there, remember Grandpa says in that video, you know, children, especially in that age range, express themselves many times metaphorically. By, by that I mean, if a penis went in a kid's butt uh, or in their vagina, they may say, he put a stick in me. Because they don't know what a penis is, they don't know what's happening to them. They talk about and express what happened to them by the way it felt. So you can't take them too literally. And that's not to say, well, if we can't take them literally, what are we talking about here? We're, 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 you know, this is the law. We're trying to find out what really happened. But that doesn't mean they're lying about a, what happened in their butt, that it was actually a stick. They may be talking about or expressing themselves by the way it felt like with the stick. Go ahead, Jen. It's interesting that you say that because mm. when I, um, I wasn't working for Dyson for too long and I was teaching the case, the little girl was saying her uncle put strawberries in her vagina, spoons, all types of mm. different fruits and crazy stuff. Yeah. And um, I wish I knew then what you're saying now. Yeah, I'll tell you something else too perpetrators do. They may, they may, the child may speak metaphorically and the perpetrator may go, we're going to put the strawberry cream on your coochie now. And they put their head, they do crazy, you know. And they, sometimes the perpetrator defines, they define the behavior to, to throw the child off about what's really happening. And, and then the kid repeats, oh, he put strawberries there. But that was just his definition of what was occurring. Um, but going back to the video, what does Grandpapa say? He goes, could you imagine? They said I put my whole head up her vagina. What could Grandpa have been doing? And the kid... Well, even more specific than that. Oral sex, right? You know, if you're five and your grandfather puts his head between your legs and licks your vagina... And you're asked what happened. Well, you say he put his head up my coochie. I mean, what, isn't that a fair characterization yeah. from a five-year-old about what they experienced? Yeah. Right? And the other thing, one of the kids, he goes, there would be evidence, wouldn't there? Another, my, my other granddaughter said that I put a sword in my, her vagina. Well, maybe it felt like a sword. And maybe she was speaking metaphorically. Look, I ain't saying they're guilty, but let's not be so smug like this is a... This is insane that this happened. No, that's the way kids express themselves. You know, maybe that five-year-old, maybe his little granddaughter, when they asked what happened, he, instead of, as some kids might say, they put a stick in my coochie, he put a sword in there. What they're trying to say is, I was penetrated and it hurt, and it was some penetrating object. Uh, but obviously they're going to 
you know, they're going to, they're, they're not going to, they don't have the capacity to express themselves in that way. So they express themselves in the way it felt. And that's when you interviewed your first and second graders. You know, you saw how they were trying to communicate what they thought about the robes and what judges do and all that. They, they, they try to express themselves in a way that made sense in their world. You know, that the oath is an oak tree. You know, the, jewel, the, the jury is jewelry. That's the only thing that made sense to them. And so they described it that way. And if they felt something poking them from behind, it felt like a stick. They called it a stick. It felt like a sword. They called it a sword. So that's one thing to think about. Again, it doesn't mean grandpa and grandma are guilty. It, it may, in fact, be 100% innocent. But let's not be so dismissive of their assertion. Um, it requires further investigation because we're learning how kids communicate with adults when they're real little and don't have the universe of language um, uh, to specifically explain what happened. Any other questions? Where's Freed's class? Yeah. In this building? Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop by and tell him to take it easy on you. Yeah, do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.